right good good evening it is uh, still uh, november 23 2021 here in the philippines southern luzon Bicol region it is uh, almost midnight almost midnight here now let's talk about indigenous three historic tools or the bushcraft of uh, stone um, stone bone and iron as tools by the way i'm your host jason chan coco i'm a entrepreneur college instructor professor i'm also a writer uh, rock guitarist slash musician martial arts researcher enthusiast um, blades builder blades uh, researcher outdoorsman prepper and survivalist in philosophy and in practice um let's talk about indigenous uh, pre-hispanic tools or uh, the bushcraft of stone uh, bone and iron first uh, what do you think is uh, the best type of bushcraft tool what could be more bushcraft than bushcraft if we are actually going to be so strict about it um, if we're gonna be talking about uh, indigenous pre-Hispanic tools, particularly in in Bicol setting, uh, or if we're gonna be talking about uh, the bushcraft of stone, of bone and iron, particularly in the Bicol setting, you have to start with with uh, history. You have to talk about uh, you have to talk about Stone Age. You have to talk about uh, Iron Age as well. Um, it is very much inevitable to not mention the, the Kalanai people. So let's talk about the so-called Kalanai connection. About the Kalanai people. Uh, the, the Kalanai people spread after uh, 1000 BC. Okay. They spread after 1000 BC. They spread across the Visayas, Palawan, and Masbate. Historically, it is known that uh, Bicol was populated by people coming from the south. People coming from the south. So the Bicolanos actually came from the south, which explains why uh, there's so much commonality between the Visayans and the Bicolanos. Um, the Kalani people is said to be the ones that introduced the use of iron. So they introduced the use of iron uh, found in the, in the so-called the Kalani pottery found in Sorsogon. Um, dated circa 200 BC. 200 BC. What they, did they find in Sorsogon, they found burial jars, burial jars with finely chiseled groove or canal. They found burial jars with finely chiseled groove or canal. So what do we mean by this? This meant that, uh, or this means that uh, the Kalani people were already using iron you know, as tools, as chisel in, in creating their burial jars. So that's what we, that's what we can glean upon uh, the burial, jar, burial jars found in Sorsogon. So also uh, the Kalani people uh, introduced the use of iron also in Sorsogon, also in Catanduanes. Uh, Masbate, etc. Bicol, uh, but but mostly in Sorsogon. Okay. What made uh, metallurgy develop in Bicol? 
as we said, uh, the use of iron was introduced by the Kalane people and later on, uh, apparently the Bicolanos became really good with metallurgy. The question now is what made the Bicolanos, you know, have a well-developed iron or metallurgical culture? According to historians and archaeologists, this is because of gold mining. Gold mining. Gold mining was comparatively developed in the Bicol region even before the coming of the Spaniards. So there, gold mining. It was really because of gold mining. So as to the question, why had a well-developed uh, metallurgical culture, aside from the fact that uh, this culture is very much, you know, pre-Hispanic, detected, detected very, very early in history, uh, via the courtesy of the Kalanay people. Uh, it's also caused by this uh, well-developed metallurgical culture. It's also caused by the so-called uh, gold mining, which was well-developed in the Bicol region, even before the coming of the Spaniards. And uh, this uh, uh, gold mines could be found, could be located even uh, in rivers, even in rivers, particularly Catanduanes, Masbate, as well as the entire Bicol Peninsula and Mambulao. Mambulao. All right. Um, these gold mines, this, uh, you know, abundance in gold led to metal craft or metallurgy, expertise in, in metal craft or metallurgical culture. And it is even said by uh, uh, historians and by uh, Spanish chroniclers that uh, they found, you know, they found the most skillful uh, artifices in jewels, uh, in gold that we have that we had seen on on these islands here in the Philippines. So they they found the uh, the best, you know, uh, designs. In the, they found the jewels and gold that were being, you know, jewelries being produced in the Bicol region at the time to be the most intricate, to be the most intricate. This is according to, to what? This is according to the uh, Spanish chroniclers. And this person called Lavizares, okay? Lavizares, a, a chronicler as well. He said that the Bicolanos had good, good armor Okay, iron corselets, greaves, wristlets, uh, gauntlets, and helmets. So they had great, you know, warrior apparel. And then uh, they also had uh, a well developed blacksmithing culture. They used, they, they called the blacksmith Pandai. So La Visares observed that among Bicolanos, uh, he, he was able to uh, observe that the Bicolanos had a well-developed blacksmithing culture and the Bicolanos called their blacksmiths as Pandai. And uh, the blacksmiths worked in a shop called Toltogan. Okay, Toltogan. Uh, and they would produce iron implements for household articles, agricultural tools, as well as complex weaponry, uh, which included native cannons called lantakas. So the, the works included complicated, you know, stuff like native cannons called lantakas. And it, it's also said that the Camarines, particularly Camarines Sur, Camarines Norte, uh, collectively called during those times as Camarines, was actually very rich in iron. And this was according to Governor Diego Salcedo, Governor General uh, Diego San Salcedo, uh, who uh, ruled uh, from 1663 to 1668. Um, 
this was at the time when the Spaniards were no longer at war with the Dutch, so they had more times in their hands and they sought to produce wheat and iron locally. I mean to say, they sought to produce wheat and iron in the Philippines. So, according to Governor Diego Salcedo, he found iron in Camarines. He found iron to be abundant in Camarines. So, needless to say, this must have uh, led to uh, the development of metallurgy and blacksmithing in the Bicol region. Now, uh, after talking about Iron Age metallurgy, and since we are talking about uh, the bushcraft of stone, bone, iron, let's go back. Let's go back. So before, of course, before the Iron Age, there was the Stone Age. Do we have evidence of Stone Age in, in Bicol? Actually, there is. Um, it is found by archaeologists that uh, also in Sorsogon, at Barrio Bato, at Bacon, Sorsogon, there's evidence of uh, Stone Age, courtesy of some burial jars uh, with the human bones inside it, very much intact. And also stone implements were also found. By the way, the, the details that I'm talking about is from uh, Dr. Dani Herona and from the the website Lakbay Tuklas Bicol. Okay, that's, that's those are actually my sources. So there, uh, evidence of Stone Age in Bicol, at Sorsogon. So this means that it could be that right there was a glitch. It could be that there were already cavemen in Bicol 3,000 years ago because of this evidence. The evidence of uh, Stone Age in the Bicol region, particularly in Sorsogon. Burial jars, stone implements. Okay. Um, but again, what could be more bushcraft than bushcraft? Of course, stone and bone. What could be more bushcraft than stone and bone? Nothing, nothing more. So what we are saying is, uh, what could be more bushcraft than stone and bone? Nothing. When we talk of uh, bushcraft tools, uh, we always think about iron, but we forget that. Uh, the more bushcraft than iron is stone and bone. Um, stones are used to kill prey or, or animals or, or when, when uh, people are when tribes were hunting, they would use stone to kill. And then again, once later, the, they would also use the bones of those animals that they were able to kill to, to kill other animals, which is actually very ironic. So there, uh, you, you would start with stones and they would use the stones to, to, to kill animals. And later on, the, the bones of those animals will also be used to kill more animals. That's for our hunting culture, aside from our agricultural culture. Um, what were the tools made of stone? Of course, uh, we had spears, you know, spears made of stone wood and stone the tip would be made of uh, stone uh, shaped as uh, you know something pointed a pointed stone uh, or or could just be a, a, a sharpened stone which would now serve as a knife or the stone could serve as a projectile you could throw it at the target and uh, as we know, as we know, uh, it later uh, developed into slingshot, bow and arrow, and then later on firearms, firearms. So stones started as a projectile. Uh, of course, uh, there's uh, tools made of bones. Of, of course, uh, we had so-called animal jaw axe. Uh, animal jaw being used as axe, and then. The wild wild bone wild boar tusk in horns, say carabao horns, and uh, 
and uh, what more? Uh, deer, deer horn, or antler, antler, being used as uh, as tools. So there. Oh. Um, that's what the the aborigines uh, used to 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 have, or the natives uh, used to have. Um, tools made of stone, tools made of bones, and later on, tools made of iron. Um, of course, the Bicolanos must have had them as well. Uh, the Bicolanos must have had them as well. The Kalanai and the others, the Negritos and the others. Uh, let's, let me show you some uh, items uh, in the so called in my armory in my gallery, so called Cimarron Armory, uh, samples of uh, so called bushcraft tools of the pre Hispanic times. Of course, we have the, the animal jaw serving as axe, so something like this. So, this is actually a water buffalo, water buffalo. Uh, bone or jaw still with the with the teeth so I actually also observed that the uh, the ifugaos also use this as kind of a weapon or an axe very very much uh, bushcraft no need to build it just have to after you you know, consume the carabao. Wait for this. You you get this, and uh, it's either that you wait for the carabao to decompose, or after consuming, should consuming it or cooking it, you acquire this one. Even nowadays, we can actually adapt this particular tool. That's why I got this one, and I will. Try to clean this up and, uh, you know, perhaps place a rubber band here for a better grip. So there, already a tool. Uh, we talked about um, horn, uh, animal horn, for example, this one, animal horn, mm, animal horn. This is actually, I think, cow, cow's horn or carabao's horn. Mm. This could serve as a tool for whatever it may serve. It may serve you. This could even be a weapon, like a carambit or something like that. Um, I've also seen some people carrying antler. Antler as a kind of a weapon or tool. Shout out to Uncle Soy, uh, an EDC guy who's taking up medicine in Manila. He's also uh, a person fond of uh, animal uh, horn or bone. And I, once I, I saw him uh, post uh, ed an EDC that, that contains antler as a kind of a weapon. The good thing about it is it cannot be detected by metal detectors, I think. So, horn, antler, uh, wild boar tusk. Uh, this one, we talked about this before. This is from the Kalinga. They actually developed this into a, a tool, a uh, uh, kind of a, a neck knife. Uh, there, an example of wild boar task being used, being turned into a into a tool. Of course, this wild boar task as well can be like a karambit. I can actually work on this and you know put some steel here or metal and make this turn this into a karambit. Something like that. Metal here can work this out. Yeah, something great. Um, and 
I think um, this use of uh, bone and even of stone as tools or weapons uh, later graduated into the use of said items as materials for knives, swords, etc. And even of firearms. For instance, uh, we have this particular uh, mini ginunting here with a carabao horn hilt or water buffalo horn hilt. You see? Uh, there is an organic element, you know, of course, well, there's the wood here and iron. So the, the use of the indigenous peoples or the pre-Hispanic people uh, here in the Philippines, particularly in Bicol, the use of bone or horn graduated into the use of said items as materials for knives and for swords and also observe it in uh, full length bolos and blades or swords like this one it also has a carabao horn uh, hilt only that it is stylized carved as uh, a deity or a kind of uh, an entity for different uh, ideas and thoughts about uh, hilt carvings you may also want to check my uh, other uh, episodes on the matter like this one this is antler okay antler turned into a handle for for a knife particularly a, a really nice uh, mini kukri knife so or uh, this one uh, wild boar tooth or fang or tusk made into uh, a material for the handle or hilt of this pinahig from the ifugao area banawe you see So coming from just being tools, the uh, material as we mentioned, the, the bones, um, horns, etc. Uh, they graduated as uh, materials, materials for knives and swords, for knives and swords. All right, um, that's it for our uh, sharing and. Uh, on indigenous prehistoric tools or the bushcraft of stone, bone, and iron. But first, uh, let's uh, do a shout out to the following people Lady Simaron, Noah Aleph Official, Hinupa Channel, Jess Adlain, Anne Marie's TV, Vanessa Vargas Vlogs. My friend Bernard Quinones, uh, Jojo Villarreal, Villarreal, an expert in bushcraft, and he also makes uh, tools out of uh, carabao horn and other materials. And uh, Will John Danieles, Domsky, Domsky, I mean Domsky Barranco, Pinay Survivalist, um, Jose Rizal Adventures, Ray Sibayan, uh, there's a Ray. And of course, uh, the Beatrice uh, brothers, the Beatrice uh, blacksmiths of uh, Rinconada area, particularly Iriga City. Um, all right, um, that's it for now. The Jason here for the Bayon channel. This is uh, a channel devoted to current events, uh, literature, music, the outdoors, martial arts, blade culture, prepping survivalism and whatnot. Remember the pen is mightier with a sword. Thanks for watching.